Professor Christina Nam. Yes, Arun. We can go ahead. We can start. All right, Arun. Sure. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Proverbs sixteen three. The Department of English, Madras Christian College, takes great pleasure in welcoming you all to be a part of this ninth T. G. Narayan Endowment Lecture, bridging barriers through literary texts. The year twenty twenty one adds yet another jewel to the department's literary diadem with our celebrated and fabulous novelist, poet, philanthropist, professor of creative writing at the University of Houston, USA. Dr. Chitra Banerjee Devakarani, with grateful hearts and eager minds, wishing for the resplendent unfurling of this event, let us invoke the Almighty's merciful blessings. I request Dr. Franklin Daniel, our dynamic support in all our endeavors, to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this. New day. Thank you for your promise, which says, "Morning by morning, new mercies we see, and great is your faithfulness." We thank you, Lord, for the ninth T. G. Narayan Endowment Lecture, and we commit Dr. Chitra Banerjee Devakarni, who is going to deliver a lecture on the topic bridging barriers through literary texts. Thank you for this rich fair that you have made possible year after year through this wonderful commitment of this family, and even as they remember Teacher Narayan, I pray that you'll bless the memory and you'll bless the family abundantly. Lord, we have gone through trying times, testing times, the pandemic, which has devastated. Millions, and Lord, many have been financially and emotionally devastated. I pray that You will shower Your grace upon them. Lord, we live in epoch-making times. The ground beneath us is radically shifting, and Lord, I pray that You will help us to fine-tune. And adjust to the changing times. The apprehensions of Rabindranath Tagore seem to come true. Where the world has been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls of race, racism. A Lord, where words do not come from the depth, depth of truth. Where only tireless striving stretches its arms towards persecution, I pray that you will stop this. I pray that your grace will be upon us, that we will be able to, Lord, land in that haven of freedom, into that haven of freedom. He prays where we we will all awake. I pray that you will bless our college, even as it's stepping into closely to the second century mark. May love, unity, brotherhood be learnt. May industry, uprightness, and courage grow from this place. May they be sent forth continually from this place, a stream of men and women who will serve thee faithfully in our world. Thank you for the English department, the faculty, the students, and all our friends who will be joining this day. I pray that you'll be greatly enriched by this lecture. Even as we come from different time zones, I pray that your grace will be upon the speaker. We pray for the technical team, the logistics that's involved, and all the participants. Bless them abundantly, and may there be your abundant blessing right through. In Jesus' almighty name, I do humbly pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Professor Daniel, uh, for the beautiful prayer. Um, we praise God for this beautiful day. Providentially, we are brought together under one roof to enjoy today's lecture. I'm happy to inform you that around 3,000 participants have registered from countries such as India, Philippines, United States, Oman, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Hungary, Mauritius, Nigeria, Morocco, Georgia, Libya, and Yemen. 
So we're extremely delighted to welcome you all on behalf of the Department of English, our dynamic and joyful head of the department, Dr. Mekla Rajan would uh, welcome us right now. Over to Dr. Rajan. On behalf of the Department of English Literacy and College, I'm delighted to welcome each and every one of you this annual with P.G. Narayan and Domino Mekhtar. We have with us our dear principal, Dr. Paul Olsen, who goes into the Internet Research Activity and mentors us. It's a privilege to have you with us, sir, and I'm very happy to welcome you. Our bursars are here with us in all events. So, a very, very warm welcome, welcome to you. you. The one the amazing thing that has happened today is the presence of our admirable and outstanding military luminary, Dr. Tita Banani. Her greatness lies in her eternal fear of nature and fascinating dynamism that dazzles. What appears to be a dreamy light became a real cause of divine intervention. And of today's admirable speaker, Madam, your palace of solutions is the unique target. Your mistress of spices, seasoned and hot and made really delicious. Your daughter of companions, that are just an enchanted other. Your one amazing thing is a John Hunter. The last queen we published on the 20th of this month, we know will be the first queen to inspire us as a season. Madam, we are proud of you and humbled and honored to have you with us. A very warm welcome to you. The most unassuming beloved son of Mr. T.G. Narayanan is Dr. Rangarara Narayanan, who instituted this in the U.S. You all see the department in the world, not only the literary and the world. You are not the same as you are the same as you are the same. We are grateful to you and I hope to enjoy well well view you this event. I'm Anish to welcome from Sushanta Manan and the board of the Dada Adios and Health. I'm glad to welcome the Dada Adios of the Cell and Non-Nazi, all the former and present head professors, research scholars and students of all the colleges. We are very fortunate to have all of you with us. A special welcome to the admirable staff and students of our department and the head and staff of the Department of English Cells and Non-Nazi. We are overwhelmed by the consistency of the world and held rendered by the technical team. There are Mr. Siobhan's headed by Mr. Arun Marmar. A sincere welcome to you. I invite all of you once again to be united and enriched by our literary queen, Dr. Krishna Banerjee. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear ma'am. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our beloved principal and inspiration, Dr. Paul Wilson, steering mightily at the helm of this great institution through these challenging times to address the wonderful luminaries and our dear participants. Morning. Am I audible? <clears throat> yes, sir, you are. Good morning. Dr. Meghla Raj, head of the Department of English. Dr. Chitra Banerjee, the resource person for today, TG Narayan and Endowment Lecture. Dear faculty members and my dear students, I deem it a privilege to be a part of this particular lecture, wherein thousands of participants have already registered to listen to Dr. Chitra. I really congratulate the Department of English for taking such efforts to reach out to the wider community around the world. The topic is uh, very close to my heart. Bridging barriers through literary texts. I used to discuss with one of our faculty members that when I was doing my uh, theology, the interest on taking up texts and criticizing it became my passion. I wanted to use different tools and I wanted to make criticism on uh, different texts. And when I was thinking that it's the background of science that helped me out in getting into this kind of literary criticism and textual criticism, and etc. And looking at the science fiction that um, the author is involved in and the creative writing that the author is involved in, 
I just want to mention in this platform because I want to make every platform very useful, not simply trying to I don't know, say something which is useless. A college is making efforts in these lines, creating a writer's cafe. I'm looking forward for many of our students and faculty members to be a part of this particular effort. And soon you will see that emerging inside the campus. We are looking forward for creative writing from our own students, not only from the Department of English. And later I found out there are many students who are inclined towards English literature, but by default they have taken up or embraced some other domain. And we are making a conscious and strategic efforts where we would like to really train people, educate them, and uh, we would like to make them as an entrepreneurs in these lines because writing is a very important uh, startup that people need to think, not only from the perspective of teaching, but also from the other aspects of uh, writing as startup. We can just, if you Google through, you can find out maybe uh, more than dozens of uh, the, the avenues where the students can uh, begin writing. And Madras Christian College is known uh, for uh, you know, budding authors and uh, maybe we can say more than a few decades and it's well known. And it is important for uh, the leader like me to leverage this particular skill that is there in the students' you know, you know, uh, personality. And I should redeem it for the benefit of the institution and for the career options of students because many times students come out of the college without knowing what to do. And it is the experience in the campus that makes them to explore themselves and carry their passion to know what would they plan maybe after completing their degree. Maybe there are budding authors, budding writers, bloggers, and so on. And I'm very sure that this lecture would really uh, do a wonderful service to those people who are really inclined towards taking up writing as a career. I'm sure Dr. Chitra would address and help us uh, in this uh, new uh, venture that the college has embraced on creating a writer's cafe. I'm thankful to the Department of English for having invited me and I wish all the best in all your endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Um, we're moving on. Um, Kent Nurburn once said, uh, remember, oh, I quote, until you have a son of your own, you'll never know the joy, the love beyond feeling that resonates in the heart of a father as he looks upon his son, unquote. I believe Dr. T.G. Narayan from heaven would feel the same right now as he looks at this lecture, which is made possible by the benevolence of his beloved son to perpetuate his glorious memory. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us Dr. Ranga Narayanan, the beloved son of Dr. T.G. Narayanan. He is a distinguished professor and William P. and Tracy Sirioli term professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, University of Florida, United States. We will now listen from him, his precious memories about his dear father. Over to Professor Narayanan. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So uh, members of the organizing committee at the Madras Christian College and distinguished members of the audience, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about the late Mr. T.G. Narayanan and why we have chosen to make this endowment that bears his name. T.G. Narayanan was born on June the 9th, 1911 in the temple town of Kumbakonam. His early schooling was at the Hindu High School in Madras, followed by higher education at the Madras Christian College in Georgetown, and then the Madras Presidency College where he completed an honors degree in English. After a few years of being a school teacher of English in Alway, Narayanan served at All India Radio and then joined the Hindu. As a journalist, he was best known for his years as a war correspondent, during which he covered the Impal Front and the war in Southeast Asia. Narayanan also worked substantially on the famine that overtook Bengal, a devastating famine that took over 2 million lives. He saw deprivation firsthand, reported on it, and then wrote a book called Famine Over Bengal, describing its cause and its horrors. Toward the end of the war, TGN was stationed in Delhi, and there he spent a couple of years interviewing many of the nation's freedom fighters and reporting on it. After the war, Narayanan joined the UN, where he was associated with the War Commission on Germany, the freedom of Indonesia from the Dutch, and in his final years was the personal representative of the Secretary General Dar Hammarskjöld on nuclear disarmament. Because TG Narayanan spent many years as a journalist and because of his abiding interest in social justice, 
It is fitting that we remember him by instituting these lectures at his alma mater. The Madras Christian College is noted for its training and education of some of, of some of the finest minds and leaders of the land. And my father would have been proud to have his name associated with these series. This will be the ninth lecture of this endowment. The Department of English has done, as always, a splendid job in arranging to get outstanding speaker, uh, outstanding speakers. This year is no, is, uh, no exception, as we are honored to have a well-known academic and novelist, Dr. Chitra Devakurni, who will tell us about her exciting work on bridging barriers through literary text. Once again, I thank you and my best wishes to all of you for a wonderful 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we truly have uh, an eminent personality amidst us to deliver the ninth TG Narayan Endowment Lecture. We feel extremely grateful for her kindness in accepting our invitation. I request Professor Dr. Samuel Rufus of the Department of English MCC to kindly introduce the speaker to the participants. Over to Dr. Rufus. Thank you, Professor Arun. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Right. Thank you, Professor Arun. Uh, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce the legendary Chitra Divakaruni. Uh, Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni is an award-winning author, poet, activist, and teacher. She's the author of 18 books, such as Mistress of Spices, Sister of My Heart, Oleander Girl, Before We Visit the Goddess, and Palace of Illusions. Her latest novel is The Forest of Enchantments, a feminist retelling of the epic, the Ramayana. She writes about contemporary life in America and India, women's experiences, immigration, history, and mythology. Her newest novel is The Last Queen, based on the life of the ferocious and fascinating Rani Jindan, who battled the British in 19th century India. On this occasion, I wish to take a small detour and recollect an incident just exactly two years ago on the same week in Jaipur, when I came all the way to Jaipur just to listen to Chitra Devakarani Banerjee. And she had a, we had a wonderful rendezvous. Shobha Day was there on the dice at the Mughal tent with the Chitra ma'am. And when she was asked a question by, uh, yes, right, by Shobha Day, right? Uh, would you be writing on Lakshman's wife as your next uh, project? She didn't answer that. She evaded that question. And then another questioner, a lady, towards the end, she asked her another question. Ma'am, would you want to write about Kunti? And then Chitra Ma'am was very clear. We were all, she said, no, I'm not planning to write about Kunti. I have somebody else in mind. Then we were all curious. We were all, you know, in quite anticipation. Now we know this latest book has, you know, this newest book, right, is uh, The Last Queen based on the life of the ferocious and fascinating Rani Jindan, who battled the British in 19th century India. Right. And uh, I, I have a lot of memories about that wonderful 40 minute rendezvous we had with Chitra Man. And I had a lot of takeaways also, um, uh, you know, just a couple of takeaways that I gleaned from this wonderful, you know, I, I, I noted it down. It's also on my blog. So she had wonderful takeaways, you know, for us. So this is Sita's strength, she said. She doesn't waste her time on what she can't do. She focuses on what she can do where she can make a better change in life. And a question was asked by Shobha Day, uh, do you believe strong women have to pay a price? Then uh, Chitra Ma'am said with all conviction, if you have to pay the price, so be it. To Sita, it was worth it, she said. And that's the thing about women's stories. Women's stories are not just about one woman. I'm just quoting like the legendary Chitra Banerjee Ma'am here. That's the thing about women's stories. Women's stories are not just about one woman. They are about the whole community of women. That's what is different about them. The Ramayana is about Ram, but the Sitayana is about all of the women in the Ramayana. So uh, we are, and uh, continuing, right? Just uh, one more paragraph. Deva Karni teaches in the nationally ranked creative writing program at the University of Houston, where she's the McDavid Professor of Creative Writing. Several of her students have gone on to publish acclaimed books and have won awards. She also serves on the Emeritus Board of Pratham, a literary, literacy organization that works with underprivileged children and provides job training and small business startup seed money for women in India. Her work, as we all know, needs no introduction. It has been published in over 100 magazines and anthologies. She has won numerous awards internationally. She lives in Houston, Texas, 
And uh, with all excitement, we are privileged and honored to have you with us this morning and evening for you at Houston. We warmly welcome you, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rufus. Each day has a color, a smell, the mistress of spices. I am buoyant and expansive and uncontainable, but I always was so, only I never knew it, the palace of illusions. Once I heard my mother say that each of us lives in a separate universe, one we have dreamed into being. We love people when their dreams coincides with ours. The way to cut out designs laid one on top of the other might match. The queen of dreams. Meandering through the forest of enchantments with a day stagger into the palace of illusions, climbing the wine of desire or stumbling upon the queen of dreams up until her latest launch, the last queen. I am Rani Jindan, mother of the Khalsa. That is my identity. That is my fate. Daughter of the royal kennel keeper, the beautiful Jindan Kaur went on to become Maharaja Ranjit Singh's youngest and last queen, his favorite. The rebel queen with an indomitable will. This novel is a cautionary tale about loyalty and betrayal. It is a powerful parable of indestructible bond between mother and child. The much needed tale of resilience for all of us post a 2020 scenario. She has definitely conquered all our hearts. And the queen here is Dr. Chitra herself. And she is undoubtedly our one amazing author. The much awaited polymark and stellar talent, Dr. Chitra Banerjee Devakarani. Dazzle us with your brilliance. Over to you, dear ma'am. Thank you. Can people hear me? Yes, ma'am. Sound is okay? It's perfect. Thank you all so much for that very generous introduction, for that very warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Thank you to the English Department of Madras Christian College. And thank you to Dr. Ranga Narayanan for inviting me on this very special occasion. Thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to be giving a talk for in memory of TK Narayanan and the wonderful work that he has done in his lifetime. I also want to give a warm hello to all of you listening out there. I know some of you will send in questions later. Thank you for joining us from many countries. I am so moved and so touched that at different times of day and night, you are all joining us for this happy occasion. And I'm going to try and make this talk fun and enjoyable, and I hope meaningful. I wanted to start with a little bit of good news. You just heard about the novel, the latest novel, My Last Queen, just came out a few days ago. I just heard from my publisher, Harper Collins, that it is the number one fiction title, the number one bestseller in crossword books all across India. So I am just so grateful, so thankful to God, and really so appreciative of all my readers who helped to make this happen. As you can tell, a book released during the pandemic is very different and very difficult because I can't be there in person uh, to talk to anyone. Um, I was remembering that wonderful occasion at Jaipur Literature Fest that you heard about. And of course, this is very different, but we do the best we can. And I am certainly happy that you are here to join me for this particular event where I will talk not only about Last Queen, but several other books. And what were some of the life lessons I tried to bring out in them? How can we bridge boundaries 
how can we bridge barriers? How can we cross boundaries through literary texts and the characters in them? But one more piece of exciting news that I wanted to share is that The Last Queen has already been optioned for a movie, which I'm, I'm amazed by and I'm very, very thankful to God for this because certainly it is only by his grace that something so amazing could happen so quickly. So on to my topic for today, bridging barriers through literary texts. I appreciated the principal telling me about Writer's Cafe, Dr. Wilson, that is such a wonderful thing to happen. I really, I encourage all the budding writers in this audience, and perhaps there are many mature and experienced writers as well. I encourage all of you to continue and do the best with your word and your art, because I think in my, all these years of living, I cannot think of anything that is more joyful and that I feel is more important than the writing I do. The writing and the teaching, both of these are very important to me, but the writing, it just seems to, you know, it seems like it's a gift. It comes from a divine source and I am just so thankful that it comes through this. And I wish that same feeling for all of you. I wish you much success as you go on to write about your own ideas, your experiences in the world, because our writing touches people more than we can imagine. Sometimes it touches people in ways that we cannot think of. I have certainly been touched by other people's writing, and I hope that my writing in some way has touched people's hearts. It is very important, of course, to study literature academically as we do in English departments at Madras Christian College and also at my university, University of Houston. And it is wonderful to uh, criticize the texts and to analyze them and to you know, find hidden meanings. But literature's power, that's only one segment of literature's power. Literature's power is much more. I believe that literature is a living entity that books take on a certain life when we hold them in our hands or on our Kindles, however we like to read. And the magic that occurs when we are alone with a book and its characters is something special. It's a special kind of experience. I think one of the reasons books are so important, literature is so important in the ways in which it can touch us and change us is that when we come to a book, we are, not, we are not defensive. Often when we approach people and they tell us what they think and they give us their ideas, uh, we might feel defensive. We might feel like we want to argue. But when we are alone with a character, we just want to be with them, learn about them, take them into us, sympathize with them, empathize with them, and therefore, Books help us, literature helps us in growing those qualities, compassion, empathy, understanding, and yes, also strength. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I hope people will get from my writing and my readers will get from my writing. Because we empathize, when characters break barriers, we also can learn to break the same kinds of barriers. In fact, it is my hope that we can learn important life skills from our favorite characters, no matter when they lived or when the book was set or when the writer wrote it. Great literature, I believe, is timeless. And so that is my hope for all of us that at the end of this lecture, we will think about some ways in which we can connect and learn from characters, some ways in which their breaking of barriers and their bridging of challenges will help us in our lives so that our lives will become 
more complex in a positive way, they'll become more successful, but also that we will become more wise, wiser, and more human. So today I'm going to discuss five barriers that are bridged by important char characters in my novels. And the first one is really an existential problem. The first barrier is an existential problem that we often face as humans in good times, but certainly when challenges occur. And that is the feeling that we are each separate beings. As humans, we are each separate. And what is good for me is not necessarily what other people want for me and what they want. They might want things from me that I don't want to give, or they might want things that I think will be detrimental to my welfare. And so there is often a, a feeling of rivalry. There's often a feeling that we are in conflict with the people around us. And what happens as this comes up is that we lose empathy and we are fighting for survival. We are struggling to get our way. One of the ways I think that literature can help us get over this barrier is that it shows us that we are not alone as human beings, that human beings have some very important traits in common. And one of them is that we are all looking for the same thing. We're all looking for happiness. We're all looking for love. We're all looking for comfort. We're all looking for security. And if we can just see that, then perhaps we can become sympathetic to other people in our lives as well. It's easy. It's easier to be sympathetic to characters in books. For one thing, they don't talk back to us. So we can have a wonderful one-way communication with them. Uh, but jokes aside, I think what we learn in the pages of a book it's not so difficult to carry it into our lives if it has really touched our hearts. So I wanted to, and how, how is the barrier bridged? How can a barrier that is between us and other people, how can it be bridged? One way is by realizing that everyone has a story to tell. I have a story to tell out of my life. You have a story to tell out of yours. And if we can listen to each other's stories, that is a wonderful way of finding out that you were not perhaps so different from me, not as different as I thought at first, that you are not really my enemy, that we are in this thing called life together, and maybe we can even help each other. This certainly happens in my novel, One Amazing Thing, where in the beginning of that novel, a group of nine people, all separately, not known to each other, most of them, unless they're in the same family. They have all come in, in San Francisco. They have all come to the Indian visa office because they want to go to India, each one for a reason of their own. But as they're waiting there for the visas, a major earthquake strikes the city and the building collapses, and now they're stuck in the basement of this building, which is where the visa office is, and they are panicking. And as we know, when we are afraid, when we are struggling for our survival, um, our social instincts of politeness kind of go away. And we begin to look at everyone else in the situation as our rival, perhaps even our enemy, uh, and in this situation, especially where there's no food, there's no water, or there's very limited amounts of this, the door is stuck and they cannot get out. Everyone begins to get very upset. They're panicking and they're turning on each other. And then one of the characters, Uma, says to them, let's calm down and let's use this time. Maybe they're coming to rescue us, but we can't do anything because there's no cell phone coverage in the basement. So she says, let's tell each other a story out of our lives. 
one amazing thing that happened to us that has made us who we are today. And at this point, I want to pause for just a moment to have you think about one amazing thing that happened perhaps in your life that has made you who you are today. And I hope that as you think of this, you can also think of someone who doesn't know this story that you can share it with. Because it is when we share our stories with each other, when we open ourselves up, make ourselves a little vulnerable to someone else, and also listen to their stories, that empathy begins to happen. And we realize something very important, which is that what we want is really not so different. And I will read you a passage from The Mistress of Spices, which points to this. And as many of you know, The Mistress of Spices, which was my first novel, is about a magical woman who ends up in Oakland City across from San Francisco in a bad part of the neighborhood where she has a little a little store, a little spice shop. But the wonderful thing about that spice shop is if you walk into it, she will look at you and she'll know what's going on inside of you. And she can give you a spice to cure you of your problems, to help you with what you want to get. And here is what she says. She understands why people come here and why people are attracted to this store. Turn the crooked corner of Esperanza where the Oakland buses hiss to a stop and you'll see it. Perfect fitted between the narrow barred door of Rosa's weekly hotel, still blackened from a year ago fire and Lee Ying's sewing machine and vacuum cleaner repair with the glass cracked between the R and the E. Grease smudged window, looped letters that say Spice Bazaar faded into a dried mud brown. Inside, walls veined with cobwebs where hang discolored pictures of the gods, their sad shadow eyes. Metal bins with the shine long gone from them, heaped with atta and basmati rice and masoor dal, row upon row of video movies, all the way back to the time of black and white. Bolts of fabric dyed in age old colors, New Year yellow, harvest green, bride's luck red. And in the corners, accumulated among dust balls, exhaled by those who have entered here, the desires of all things in my store, they are the most ancient. For even in this new land, America, this city which prides itself on being no older than a heartbeat, it is the same things we want again and again. And so when we become aware of people's desires, when we become aware of the fact that we all are desiring the same things, I think we are on our way to bridging a very big barrier, the barrier of human separation. What is perhaps Another important barrier that we have to break. That is the barrier of desiring revenge. And if we are honest with ourselves, we will probably, all of us find, there were times when we were angry. We felt we were treated badly. Wrong was done to us by people who we thought of as evil people, or maybe not evil all the time, but they did something wrong to us. We felt we were, I don't know, we deserved justice and we deserved revenge. But revenge is something that will end up by harming us. It will create a huge barrier. There is no end to it. And that is what, that comes up several times in many of my novels where People are wronged and then they do something and it creates a cycle, a kind of devolving cycle of hatred, maybe violence, maybe just the death of a friendship. I have a lot of books that talk about this barrier, but perhaps 
the most important ones are the Palace of Illusions and the Forest of Enchantments, where revenge becomes a big theme. Wrong is done, for instance, to Draupadi and her husbands. Their kingdom is taken away wrongly. Uh, they are made to lose all of their wealth in a game of dice that is clearly not illegal, not done legally. Um, she is shamed in open court. And there's a great deal of anger within her for a long time. And Krishna tries to teach her the problem with this barrier, this barrier of revenge that makes us want to do just the worst things and think we're doing them for the right reasons. So he thrusts a burning stick at Draupadi at one point, And he says, and when she pulls back, he says, look, here's the stick. It could have hurt you, you pulled back, but what is it doing to itself? It's burning itself up, it's destroying itself. So that is the problem with revenge. Not only does it harm someone else, but it harms us most of all. How are we to bridge this barrier? The answer to that is come, comes from the palace of, sorry, the forest of enchantments. So Sita will provide us with an answer. At the very end of her story, and as you know, Sita has such an amazing story. So many things are, happen to her, the ways in which she re reacts, and you heard some of them already. She doesn't waste her time on recrimination or on regret. She just moves ahead and does what she needs to, and yet she will not compromise. She is very clear about her values. And at the end, because she is so clear about her values, she refuses to go through the fire, the fire trial, the trial by fire that Ram asks her, even though she knows that that means the end of the happiness she had dreamed of herself, her husband, her children all together as a happy family, that's not going to happen, but she doesn't compromise. And at the last moment, when she is leaving this human sphere, Ram is very upset because through all of it, he loves her greatly and he asks for her forgiveness. And I'm going to read to you from the very end of the Forest of Enchantments, where I hope there is, in Sita's words, a way for us to break this barrier, the barrier of revenge, and to enter that sacred space of forgiveness. I have one last thing he's been saying, forgive me, or silently, she hears him in her mind. I have one last thing I must do before I turn back from woman to goddess, before my new world envelops me in pristine bliss, obliterating all complicated, contradictory human emotions. One last crucial thing I must tell my husband. And when I was writing these words, I felt that Sita was speaking to me. She was telling me also, because I too needed to learn this lesson. I too needed to know how to bridge this barrier. I forgave you a long time ago, I say to Ram, though I didn't know it until now, because this is the most important aspect of love, whose other face is compassion. It isn't doled out drop by drop. It doesn't measure who is worthy and who isn't. It is like the ocean, unfathomable, astonishing measureless. So I started by saying that the cure, the bridge for the problem of revenge is forgiveness. But really, it's a little more than that. Because forgiveness is just the start, but love is the end. Yes, we forgive. But in order to fully forgive, perhaps we have to love. And in order to fully love, it goes back in a circle to what we were, I was talking about earlier. We have to see that what the other does is, or what the other person wants is not so different from what I have wanted as a human being. We are really both driven by the same needs and desires. 
and most among them is the highest among them is the desire for love. Another barrier that we often have to cross, men and women both, but especially women, is facing the pressure of public opinion. What should we do? Society often tells us what's the right thing to do, even if we don't feel that that's the right thing for us. And again, I feel perhaps for women, this is a little harder. Society presses on us with greater pressure. So what a good woman does is often defined much more than what a man is allowed to do. How are we to bridge this pressure? I'll give you an example of this pressure. And for this, I'm going to draw upon my newest book. And this is a special moment for me because I haven't read from this book before. So you will be the first audience who hears me reading from this book. And I'm kind of excited and a little nervous. So if we think we have a problem, Rani Jinda had a much worse situation. There were so many things that she was expected to do. For instance, when her husband, Maharaja Ranjit Singh dies, she is expected to become a sati and die on his funeral pyre. Many of his wives, including her best friend, Rani Gudda, decides to do that. And there's a lot of pressure of public opinion on her. You know, all these Ranis, they really loved Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Look at them. They're just uh, going to sacrifice their lives. And why aren't you doing that? Did you not love him? Were you not? Are you scared? Are you even a good wife? So all of these things come up in her. But she is determined that that is not the right thing for her. Not because she is afraid. For a while, she considers it. But because she has a little baby. He's only about a year old at this time. And she realizes that her duty is to her child. And she decides that she is going to live no matter what people say. She's going to live. She's going to take care of her child. She's going to bring him up to be the best person he can be. She doesn't think at this point that he's going to be king because there are many older brothers and other relatives that come in line before him. But she is determined that her job as a mother is more important. It is her present responsibility and her present relationship that she holds on to. So, so that is one, one time. And then many things happen over the next few years. Her son is still very young. He's about six years old, when through amazing circumstances that I won't go into, all the people who stand between him and the throne die due to wars, due to treachery, due to all kinds of things. And so Jinnah suddenly finds that her son is going to be king. He's going to be Maharaja. And now what everybody expects her to do is that she will give him into the keeping of the courtiers, of the wazir, and they will actually run the kingdom with him on the throne. And she will go into the zanana as a good widow should and just they say, live there and you know say her prayers and all those good things. Maybe make sure her child has the right things to eat and to wear. But Jindan says, no, Jindan says, I am going to go into that court with him. You are not going to manipulate my son. I am going to be queen regent. And she does some amazing things. She dispenses with the veil, which was very uncommon for a woman in her situation at that time. She goes and meets with the army, the Khalsa army, very powerful army that Maharaja Ranjit Singh had put together. And she impresses them so much that they decide that they will support her. So they become her big support. And they even call her mother of the Khalsa. And so she manages to run, help run the kingdom and keep her son safe. Now, how did she do it? How was she able to get over public opinion? How is it that she 
said, I'm not going to care. I think it's because she believed in a cause. She believed that she had a duty towards her son and she loved her son. So it's a combination of love and duty and a belief in herself. I have to be a good mother. I have to be a strong mother. Yes, I can do it. So that is how she crosses that barrier. Now, she's going to cross another very important barrier in, at the end of her life. Many things will happen to Jindan. I won't go into it so much over here. She will be imprisoned by the British. She will resist them, but they'll put her in prison. They'll take her son away from her. They will take the kingdom away from uh, her son, Maharaja Dalip Singh. They will exile him and send him to England. She will manage to run away from prison, escape from prison and find asylum all the way across in Nepal. Think of what a strong woman. Think of how even the worst um, setbacks didn't stop her because she was determined that she was going to do everything she could to see her son again. And actually that will happen. He will manage, it will be years and years later, but he'll manage to come back to India pretending that he's coming for a tiger hunt, which was a popular thing that young British men did at that time. He comes to Calcutta and he tells his mother, he gets a message to her and she comes down from Nepal and they meet. And then they decide they are not going to be parted. The British will not let them stay in India because there's a lot of a feeling for them and people are already trying to gather around the hotel and you know they want their king back. Um, there were Sikh soldiers who came there at that time and they wanted their king back. So the British quickly send them back to England. Now, when she comes to England, Maharani Jindal learns something, which is that all this while, the British have completely culturally colonized her son. He has forgotten who he is. He has no idea of how great his father was or the kingdom that was taken away from him was. He has lost his religion. He has lost all pride in being Indian. And she thinks, what can I do? I have to save my son. He's lost all sense of pride, identity, everything that makes him who he is. And she has to make a very difficult decision at that point. And I'm going to read to you a little bit from there because she knows that he's happy enough in England. He doesn't see any problem. You know, he lives, it, the British government gives him a little money. You know, he lives like the other lords. He goes shooting, he goes, he has parties. He's not that unhappy, but he has no sense of who he is. And she knows that she could leave things like that. But would that be the right thing to do? So, and this is when she's almost dying because she's very ill by now. The, the years in prison have really destroyed her health. I have a very important decision to make, one that requires all my concentration. She's really on her deathbed by the time she's thinking this. I could give Dalip my dying blessing to carry on in his indolent ways, as though he were a minor English nobleman, unconcerned with the larger world, as long as he's given enough money for his frivolous pastimes. He'll be happy enough with his estate and his shooting parties, his hunting and his hawks, his invitations to lead processions and royal weddings and worship along Victoria in her chapel. He'll be of no trouble to anyone and of no use. I could do that. It is, after all, what the British want. Or I could try to remind him one last time of who he really is. But if I succeed, I'll doom him to restless unhappiness for the remainder of his life. And you can probably guess what she does. Yes, she reminds him of who he is. She tells him what she thinks his duty is. She gives him love again for his motherland. And, though, and in that way, 
I think she finally is victorious over the British. So what did she do over here? All the forces were against her. She couldn't change anything on the outside, but she could change how her son saw himself. She had a strong sense of identity. She drew upon it and she used that strength to give him his strength of identity. So when everything is against us, if we can just pull on that strength that is within us, we have, we have more strength within us than we ever think. We have more at the core of ourselves than we give ourselves credit for. And that is a great way to break that barrier of all kinds of negative circumstances around us. All her life, Jinda, she doesn't have much on the outside. She doesn't have a lot of support. She draws on the strength that is inside each one of us. And I hope that her story inspires all of us to do that. I'm going to end with the final barrier. And this is the barrier of guilt and shame that is put upon us. And again, perhaps women feel this, are made to feel this a little more. When they become victims of circumstances that are not in their control, and often they're victims perhaps of crimes, of abductions, of rape, of violence of many different kinds. Often society says the woman is at fault. Often at least a question is brought up. Did she do something to make this happen to her? Is she the reason why she was the victim of a crime? What was she wearing? Why was she out there at this time? She shouldn't have done this. She should have, she, she should have comported herself differently. My work with the domestic violence survivors for over 30 years now shows how deep the effects of this can be, how women can really, although they were the victims of a situation of a crime, they can go through life thinking I was at fault. What could I have done right? What could I, what did I do wrong that I could have made right? If my husband was angry with me and he beat me, maybe I could have prevented that. Or situations of so many kinds where the woman is the victim. And I, I think that barrier we break by recognizing the truth of a situation and also by recognizing something very important about shame. And I'm going to end by reading to you a passage in Draupadi's voice. And, and at a moment which anyone who's familiar with the Mahabharat will surely respond to and resonate with. This is where she, Draupadi, is brought into the Sabha, the Kaurav Sabha. You know, they are in court. They have been playing dice. Yudhishthir has lost everything. And finally, he has lost Draupadi. And Duryodhan says, bring her into court and they are going to disrobe her. They're going to shame her in public. It is the worst thing that she can think of that's happening to her. And I will read a little bit here. The bards sing of what occurred when Dushasan took hold of my sari to pull it away, exposing my nakedness to all eyes. How more and still more fabric appeared until he was exhausted with tugging. Was it a miracle? I don't know. I'd shut my eyes. My body would not stop trembling though I willed it to. I clutched my sari in my fists as though I could save myself with that futile gesture. The worst shame I could imagine was about to befall me. I who had thought myself to be above all harm, the proud and cherished wife of the greatest kings of our time. Now they sat frozen as I struggled with the Shasin. Then, Maybe because there was no one who could help, I thought of Krishna. He owed me nothing. We were not related. 
Perhaps that was why I could fix my mind on him without being swept away by the anger that arises from expectation. I thought of his smile, the way it would appear on his face for no reason. The sounds of the courtroom faded, the chasson's grunts, the whisper of the watchers. Suddenly, I was in a garden. There were swans in a lake, a tree that arched above, dropping blue flowers, the sound of water falling as though the world had no end. The wind smelled of sandalwood. Krishna sat beside me on a cool stone bench. His glance was bright and tender. No one can shame you, he said, if you don't allow it. It came to me in a wash of amazement that he was right. Let them stare at my nakedness, I thought. Why should I care? They and not I should be ashamed for shattering the bounds of decency. Was that not miracle enough? And that is how we cross that final barrier, the barrier of guilt and shame. We control our sense of self. We realize that if we haven't done anything wrong, no one can shame us. Shame isn't something that is put upon us from the outside. We control how we feel about ourselves. And that is the final bridge that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much. Thanks a mighty million, dear ma'am. Thank you, that was really wonderful. The lovely way in which you have highlighted and listed these barriers and have also provided beautiful remedies for those uh, lovely verbal with your narrative tale and especially um, the way in which we understand and appreciate life uh, and the way in which we face life. I think after 2020, all the miseries and uh, uh, theme, uh, during the previous year, what was so fascinating was the hope with which uh, humanity could move on. Character inspiration resilience with regard to equanimity and courage to face life. So thank you very, very much. And uh, uh, I think we are... Thanks a lot, ma'am. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we just had an amazing time uh, hearing Professor Devakarni speaking with us. Um, I know all of you are very much interested in waiting for uh, the interactive session, the question and answer session. Before that, I have uh, an announcement. Meanwhile, you can post your questions in the chat box. Um, the TG Narayanan Endowment Lecture, Endowment, not only supports um, amazing lectures like this, but also supports student prizes every year. Now, um, I request Professor uh, David Abraham Albert uh, from our Department of English to announce the prize winners of the essay competition. Over to Professor David Abraham. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Arun. It gives me immense pleasure to announce the prize winners of the essay competition. 26 students from the second MA participated, and the topic that was given to them was culture and its impact on creativity. I am proud to acknowledge that all the 26 students did a commendable job. However, the committee comprising the senior faculty members assessed and decided on the first and second prizes. As, an, as I announced the prize winners, I request the prize winners to kindly switch on your videos and wave your hands. The first place goes to Terza Rebecca David. The second place goes to Nivedita Gideon. Few papers were good and deserve certificates of merit. Sangamitra Nataraj, Sudesh Prabhakaran, John Suhan Apasami, and Amita Rachel Thomas. I would like to congratulate all the winners. The papers which won certificates of merit 
and also all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Professor David Abraham Albert. Uh, now we're, we are moving to the Q&A session. Uh, now I request Dr. Phoebe Angus from our Department of English to kindly coordinate the session. Over to Dr. Angus. Thank you, uh, Professor Arun. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations, madam, on the success of your novel, Last Queen. That was an invigorating lecture. Participants, I'm sure you enjoy the idea shared by madam. I think your curiosity is kindled and you're very eager to ask any questions. You are kindly requested to post your questions in the chat box or in the YouTube comment section as I present a very brief summary of the lecture. Great li literature is timeless. Books take on a certain life. It can touch us and change us. When we are alone with a book, empathize with the characters. We can connect and learn from those characters. They help us to develop humane qualities and inspire us to become a better human being. Because we empathize when characters break barriers, we also can learn to break the same kinds of barriers. So the five barriers that were presented that are bridged are firstly, the barrier of human separation, bridged through storytelling, which makes us realize that we all desire the same things. Second, the barrier of seeking revenge, bridged through the act of forgiveness and reconciliation, with love and compassion rendered immeasurably. For forgiveness is just the start and love is the end. Thirdly, the barrier of societal pressure of adherence to public opinion, bridged through realization of our duty, of love and duty to self and those who matter to us. Fourthly, the barrier of negative circumstances overcome by drawing our inner strength. And finally, the barrier of guilt and shame when we become victims of circumstances that are beyond our control, which are bridged by seeking, finding, and recognizing the truth. So on that note, may I present the questions that have been asked uh, so far? Yes, please. Please uh, go ahead. No rush, you, you find the... Your job is a tough one. You have to find the best questions. Yes, yes. yes participants, you're invited to uh, ask your questions. You can use the YouTube comment section or the chat box. And while we are waiting, if you have a question, you can start us off also. Uh, Ma'am, good morning. Thank you for that wonderful talk. I have a question personally. Uh, from uh, you know, you said uh, two years back that uh, the forest of enchantments was uh, very rigorous for you because you had to do a lot of research. And uh, you also said that it was something closer to your heart. Do you or what? You know, uh, my question is, which one is closer to your heart, the Palace of Illusions or the Forest of Enchantments? <laughs> You know, that is a good question, but that's like asking me which one of my children is my favorite. And as a good mother, I love all of them in different ways, but equally. So I think that is true of all my books. I do have to say that Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments and Last Queen, these are probably the closest to my heart because I worked uh, the longest on them and I worked really you know, rigorously and intensely, I had to do a lot of research. And then I had to take that research material and shape it so that it would make, you know, it would create a good story that it would be a story that readers could relate to. I couldn't just give research facts. I had to create characters who would come alive. I think I've worked the hardest on these three books. And for that reason, you know, I think that they are my favorites. And perhaps, it, ultimately, readers will have to judge. But I think perhaps these are my three best books. And especially the Forest of Enchantments, you said about the research you had done. You had come to even Kambaramai, right? Um, yes. You said that yes. The, the portrayal of Ravan had uh, impressed you, right? You said. so. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I took my sources. You know, I went all across India for my sources, because there are so many Ramayans and each one 
is a little different and focuses on something a little different. And as you said, I love the Kambaramayan for that reason, because it shows what an amazingly complex character Ravan is with many, many, um, many, many admirable qualities. But ultimately, I think his ego is what brings him down. He has, he decides that, you know, I have to get revenge. Again, revenge is a big theme here for my sister and what was done to her. And then even after he's brought Sita, there are opportunities for him to send her back. But then his ego comes in the way and he's like, no, I cannot have anyone think that I was afraid and so I sent Sita back. So that is what leads to his downfall. But he is in many ways, such a noble person. I mean, although Sita is in his power, and you know, we have to give a lot of credit to Sita's own strength of character that forces him to teach her, uh, to treat her with respect. But he is also a person who does respect her and he never takes advantage of her even though she is in his power. So I'm glad you brought that up because you know, our mythologies have given us so many amazing characters. And that's why I love these two books. And I hope that they make readers realize how our mythology lives on, how we can continue to learn from these characters. And again, they teach us they're great role models for breaking barriers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are a few questions uh, that I would like to put together and ask. They're kind of related. So the first question, uh, can you be called a feminist writer? And the next is how different is the plight of a woman at present as compared to the mythological ones? And the third one, do you see yourself writing a story centered around a historical male protagonist who's explored as extensively as Draupadi or Sita are? Very good question. Three questions. Together. Yes, yes. Thank you. I'll try to remember all three. If not, I'll ask you to repeat the second and third ones. So <laughs> am I a feminist writer? You know, that is such a loaded term. It means very different things to different people. So I'll just say this is what this is the kind of writer I am. I'm really interested in women's stories. And the reason I'm really interested in women's stories is that for so many years, so many centuries all over the world, the women have been pushed to the corners. In many of the tales, we realize this, right? We see in the traditional tellings or retellings of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, we see this most clearly. You know, we hear a lot about the Pandavas, we hear a lot about the war. Uh, even in Ramayana, we hear more about Ram and Lakshman and the war with Ravan. We even hear more about the weapons. There are pages and pages of descriptions of the weapons being used by these men. And we hear relatively little about the women. The women are there mostly as plot devices, I could say, to move the story along. So this is what the man does. He marries her. This is what the man does. He abducts her. This is what the man does. He tries to pull off her clothes. This is what the man does. He sends her away to the forest. So, you know, I'm mixing the uh, two uh, epics together, but so, so she, is, she is not an agent in herself. And what she is thinking, what is going on in her mind as all these things are happening to her have not been a focus for, the, for a large number of these cases, for the large part, I would say. And so my project as a writer is to bring women back to the center and to have them talk to us in their own voice and to really explore the thoughts and emotions that they must be going through as these immense events were occurring. So I'm not sure if that makes me a feminist writer or a writer who is just interested in balance. I will let readers decide that. But yes, I think women are in the center of my stories 
and probably there to stay. So which brings me back, brings me to the third question, which is, am I thinking of maybe writing a novel which has a man in, at the center? Uh, probably not, at least right now. You know, who knows? We change. I'm open to change. I think it's not a good idea to be stuck in one way of thinking and saying, I'll never do anything else. I'm always open to unexpected possibilities that come up. But I think there are still so many women that I know of whose stories I would like to tell or women in certain situations in different time periods. I just want to tell their stories. So I think that's probably just going to keep happening for a while. Uh, there was a second part to the question. If you could repeat that second part, I can answer it. Yes? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Do you see yourself writing a story centered around historical male protagonists and who is who is explored as extensively as Draupadi or Sita are? So, so yeah, I said that probably not for a long time, at least not in the near future. Was there another part to the question that I missed? Is this the question? And the second question, how different is the plight of a woman as compared to the mytholo mythological ones? Yes, that is a very good question. Because what I think has happened is, of course, women have you know, gained in many wonderful ways. But on the other hand, women of mythological times had a lot of advantages, especially if they were you know, well-to-do or they came from at least middle-class families, and, and those are the ones whose stories we know. Unfortunately, we don't know many stories of women who came from a more of a working class background. There were no, they, they were not the major characters, but the women of higher stature, higher social stature did have a lot of the same advantages. They had, you know, they had their own money, they had their education, um, they had some amount of power of their own. So I'm not sure that we can say that things are better for everyone now. Um, I think things were good for women of a certain class in the past. I think things are better for women who did not have power before in earlier ages, even like a century or a couple of centuries back. Um, but what I think is that although women have gained a great deal and have become more self-aware, they are still facing a lot of the similar problems that Draupadi or Sita faced, which is why I think people really responded to Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments because they felt they could relate to these issues and problems. For instance, Sita is one of the first single mothers of literature bringing up children by herself. She's, you know, her husband is not in the picture when she's bringing up love and Kush. And I think many women of uh, today would also unfortunately be able to relate to that. So I don't think we can make a blanket statements saying things are better now in every way. I think some of those older problems are still repeated in society. Uh, maybe a better way to think about it is what are the problems that women are still facing today that we can work on? I think perhaps that will help us move forward. And that is really the, the spirit of someone like Sita or uh, Queen Jinda, where they're looking at, okay, this is the situation. These are the problems. What can we do to make things better? So I guess that's my answer. Good morning, ma'am. I'm Malini from QMC College. Uh, 
um it's a privilege it's a really my honor to see you to hear you through this platform first of all thanks for the department which gave this beautiful opportunity for us much sensitive issues i mean the barriers uh, which are too difficult or too delicate to deal with are expressed in a beautiful and vivid way ma'am very in a meaningful way ma'am it's really uh, again it's an honor i can say different ways of bridging barriers you have explained through feminist role plays i i was the person who asked uh, whether you could be addressed as a feminist writer because even more than a feminist writer there be a barriers you said were in related to the feministic characters and we really thankful ma'am really it's a great pleasure to see you and hear from such a great person's talk the very delicate points which you discussed in a very clear way it's difficult to deal with but the way you expressed and uh, said was beautiful thank you ma'am yes ma'am there's another question uh, do you feel the struggle pressure a woman goes through today is much more complicated or deeper and do you have have any plans to write on this is the question Yes ma'am do you feel that the struggle and pressure that a woman goes through today is much more complicated or deeper and do you have any plans to write on this Well you know um a lot of my novels are set in contemporary times for instance before we visit the goddess or oleander girl they're set in very contemporary times in fact in uh, before we visit the goddess i did something different where the novel ends actually in a futuristic time beyond the year when i was writing it so i think i'm i'm very aware of uh, what women are going through right now and i have a lot of sympathy for things that are going on and you know i have suggested perhaps in in the novels uh, some of these how some of these issues might be handled so for instance uh, there are issues that are i guess they've been there before but they're more relevant to our times and one of them is the breakup of the families through immigration so you know the older parents stay in india their children go maybe to england or to the us for career reasons and what happens then what happens to the family what happens to traditions culture even the taking care of the old sometimes the older parents are also taken over to the west but then they feel very out of place they feel like they've lost their whole culture uh, what happens with the relationship between the grandparents and the grandchildren all of these are issues that i've dealt with even in the a short story collection such as the lives of strangers unknown errors of our lives and so forth in arranged marriage for instance i deal with what happens to a woman when she goes away from her home country and all of a sudden she's lost all her extended support her friends her relatives her parents the only person she knows perhaps is her husband she married him she went there and that's it so those are some uh, contemporary issues that i continue to be aware of and struggling with myself and of course the issue of domestic violence i don't think that is a new issue but it's certainly unfortunately a contemporary one now uh, i would like to say that although women are at the center of my novels and my stories often the men characters the male characters are very important often you know it's not like uh, i am i'm saying women good men bad that would be terrible of me as a writer that would be very short sighted and uh, you know not complex the opposite of complex simplistic uh, so a lot of times men are also going through their challenges and their difficulties especially when it comes to the issue of racism often uh, men are in a very bad situation often they're dealing with social pressures and um you know they're dealing with class differences religious differences they're dealing with the lack of opportunity 
So I have a lot of sympathy for my male characters, many of whom help women, or many times the women help men. And again, I, I want to go back to the Palace of Illusions for um, an example of this, because Krishna is a very important character in the Palace of Illusions. And in some ways, he is Draupadi's best friend. He is the one she can turn to when she can't turn to anyone else. She's the one he jokes with, and he's the one she jokes with also. And, you know, as we do with friends, she asks him for favors. She asks him to help her out of difficult situations. He comes and says, uh, you know, feed me, I'm hungry. So the, that sweetness of the male-female relationship, it's certainly there in Palace of Illusions, but also in several of my other uh, books where women who have no one to turn to often turn to men, sometimes even strangers who do help them and who help them see themselves. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are two related questions. Ma'am, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, morning, ma'am. Thank you for that accelerating lecture of yours. And I have a simple question. Uh, uh, it's a general question pertaining to all kinds of revisionism, ma'am. I consider revisionism as a narrative negotiation, right? Wherein uh, probably the characters give, are given their space to voice out their uh, stance, uh, like how Draupadi does or Sita does. But at the same time, I'm of the opinion, I'm uh, seeking your stance and the take in this particular opinion of mine, ma'am. Uh, revisionism, when it is done within the confines of the original frame, framework, it is a different kind. And when revisionism is done beyond the confines of the original framework, will it not have an impingement on the cultural and the religious uh, impact, especially in, Indi in the Indian scenario, ma'am? That is a very uh, good question. Because yes. especially now, uh, mythology has become such a popular genre, right? Mythology has become... You know, it has become a best-selling genre. So people are, many people are re rewriting the stories yes, yes, or they're taking characters from mythology. It could be Ramayana, it could be Mahabharata, it could be some of the Puranas, it could be many things. So, you know, um, I am of your opinion. I go along with you. And one of the things that was very important for me in writing The Palace of Illusions, as well as Forest of Enchantments, is that every major fact that I took, I took from one version or other of the Ramayans or the Mahabharats. And there are more Ramayans than Mahabharats, so I had a lot of Ramayans to choose from. And therefore, like people said, you know, Kamba Ramayan comes into Forest of Enchantments, but also Valmiki, also the Bengali Krithivas, also Adbhut Ramayan, but I didn't change any of the major facts yes. um, that were not in any. And that was just for me. You know, other writers have their own choices. I respect that. But I didn't want people to say, oh, you know, here she is telling us Sita should be looked at differently. But this is not Sita at all. She's just imagined. No, every major fact of Sita's life comes from one of the Ramayans or the other. So the reader cannot discount it. The reader can only say, oh, this is a different interpretation that I never thought about. But look, it is based on facts and therefore I have to think about it. Was Sita really always meek and mild and just putting up a victim of circumstance? Or was she the person who really stood up and said, no, I will go to the forest with you, Ram. Was she the kind of person who had so much strength of personality that Ravan couldn't do anything to her? Was she the kind of person who, when Ram asks for Agni Pariksha, no, he actually does not ask for Agni Pariksha. That's not in Valmiki and it's not in Forest of Enchantment. He just says, I have rescued you from Ravan. Now you please go where you want. Maybe you can stay with Vibhishan. Maybe you can go with Sugreed. And she is so hurt. She says, you cannot tell me what to do anymore. You, you are following your dharma, I will follow mine. And she asks for the fire. She asks for the fire so that she can end her life honorably, right? So, but that is in the Valmiki. 
I did not make that up. But I wanted to point at it to show that the picture that we've created of Sita over the centuries through popular retellings, maybe movies, whatever, it follows the patriarchal narrative, but that's not what our mythology shows. Our mythology shows a strong woman. And that's why it's really important for me to stay with those original texts. But, but the others, you know, everybody must make their own decision. Yes. And there, maybe what they are attempting is something different. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So this will be the last question. Uh, three questions are there, but uh, are they similar? So I'd like to uh, share all the three. The first one, do you think that women of the working class of the ancient times live better than the women of royalty as these women were compelled to do some things only for protecting the kinship. And the second is, uh, you wrote about women in ethics and a woman in history as well. Could you please talk to us the differences and commonalities between retelling the myths and fictionalizing history? And the third one, do you think the glorification through feminist writings are necessary in shaping or helping women to position themselves in the society? Is it necessary to glorify women at all times? Okay, very good questions. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to uh, ask you to repeat them one at a time so I can answer each one. So yeah. please tell me the first one. Yes, the first one. Do you think that women of the working class of ancient times lived better than the women of royalty as these women were compelled to do some things only for protecting the kinship? Yes, the yeah, that's a good question. It's kind of the same question or a similar question as saying, uh, do let's say middle-class women today uh, live better than rich women because okay, rich women or you know, women who are prominent in society have to behave a certain way, all their actions are looked at, but middle-class women and maybe even you know, uh, women who live in villages, they have a lot of freedom. Yes, it's balanced though. Right, because the rich women have power of a different kind. They have luxuries. They have education. They have may maybe you know the ability to travel. They have certain things that they can do, which the women who are not as well off cannot do. The women who are not as well off, because the eye of society is not on them as much, they are free in certain ways. But I think uh, the the crux of the matter is what would the women say if you ask them, if you ask a rich woman, would you rather be a poor woman who can then, you know, wander around and do whatever you, you can't do because everyone's always watching you, would you like that? And then if you ask a poor woman, would you like to be rich like that person? What would they say? So that's the answer. I think they would probably say, both of them, well, you know, yeah, being rich has some problems and it has some restrictions, but boy, I want to be rich and powerful. I don't really want to be at the mercy of all these social and economic forces. So that's what I kind of feel. Yes, ma'am. The second question is, could you please talk to us about the differences and commonalities between retelling the myths and fictionalizing history? That's a great question. Uh, in both, I had to do a lot of research. And in both, I explored the spaces that were empty, that were absent. So just like in uh, Forest of Enchantments, we don't really know what Sita's thinking when she's alone in the forest with Ram. So I have made that into a romantic space for the two learn to get to know each other, have an extended honeymoon of sorts, and what are the things, how are they spending their time, right? So there wasn't anything much about that in the original text. So I felt that that blank space, then I could draw upon that blank space. And it's exactly the same thing, interestingly, with Queen Jinda's story, uh, because a lot is known about her husband, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, a lot is known and written about her son, Maharaja Dalip Singh. So we have a lot of information, but there are large stretches of her life where we are only given one or two lines. For instance, 
And, and that was where I felt I could freely fictionalize, knowing what I know about her character through researching the other times. So for instance, what is amazing about her is she was the daughter of the fort's kennel keeper. So she was a dog trainer's daughter. And for Maharaja Ranjit Singh to marry a person like that, she must have been not only beautiful, which we know she was, but she must have been exceptional in her character, in her intelligence, for him to feel not just, I'll make her into a concubine, but I'll make her into a queen. And she was actually his final, his last queen. No one, he married no one else after her. So knowing that, I, have, I felt free to create the scenes of how they would meet and how they would fall in love with each other. So that's like one example of a space that was left empty. And I was like, okay, I can go in there and I can create something. Or what is she feeling like when she is locked up in the British prison? Her son has been taken away from her. She, all her attendants have been removed. Her money has been taken. Her jewelry, most of it has been taken away. How is she feeling? We don't know that. History doesn't tell us. So I felt that I could go and create those moments and bring her alive in a human way for my readers. Thank you, ma'am. So this is the final, final question. Do you think the glorification through feminist writings are necessary in shaping or helping women to position themselves in the society? Is it necessary to glorify women at all, all times? Thank you. That is a good question. And the word I would examine a little bit over there is glorification, because I don't believe in glorification of women, because glorification seems to be something that is away from the truth, that says that woman as she is, is not enough. Therefore, she has to be made into a heroine, she has to be glorified, she has to be made into a goddess. And I don't believe that at all. Um, all of my women, Draupadi and Sita and uh, Maharani Jinda, they are all women who have human faults and flaws. They lose their temper. Uh, sometimes they tell things that are not quite true. You know, different ones do different things. Sometimes they fall in love with the wrong person. Sometimes they lose their tempers and say terrible things to people close to them. And I've shown them just as they are because I don't believe that a woman has to be perfect any more than a man has to be perfect. I don't believe that a woman can be perfect any more than a man can be perfect. We are all humans. We have our flaws but we deserve to be treated with dignity. We deserve to be taken seriously, no matter what our flaws are. Because women that I portrayed like Mother Sita and Draupadi and the women of everyday life in my other stories in Before We Visit the Goddess or Queen of Dreams or Sister of My Heart, they have their failings, but they deserve to be treated with dignity. I think every human being deserves that. Not in spite of flaws, but because we are human and we have flaws. If we were perfect, we would not need to be treated with dignity. But that is not the human condition. I want people to have empathy for the human condition of women. The only thing that I ask is, don't hold women to impossible standards that are not possible for any human being. So if you're not holding men to impossible standards, don't hold women to impossible standards. Enjoy, appreciate, and respect women for who they are with all their flaws. Even with all their flaws, there's a lot in them to admire and to emulate and to take as role models so we can break those barriers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for questions. Thank you, participants, for your enthusiasm. And on that note, we come to the end of the question and answer session. Over to Professor Christina and Professor Arun. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Phoebe. 
that was beautifully done. It was such a great onus that you'd taken up to consolidate the questions and to uh, sort of interconnect them and to present it to ma'am. You did a fabulous job. And we are extremely beholden to Dr. Chitra Devakarani for very patiently and wonderfully answering these questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. I now call upon the vivacious, ever so kind Dr. Anne Thomas to propose the vote of thanks. Good morning, one and all. Respected uh, resource person, Dr. Chitra Banerjee Devakarani, the Institute of the Endowment Lecture, Dr. Wilson, the Bursa, Mr. Cyrus Kalubarikal, the head of the department, Dr. Mekla Rajan, the member of the board of directors of Madras Christian College, uh, Dr. Shanti Manuel, distinguished professors, beloved students, ladies and gentlemen, and all participants from the various corners of the world. In the words of Alice Walker, I quote, thank you is the best prayer that anyone could say as it expresses extreme gratitude, unquote. As we read in Psalms chapter nine, verse one, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. The Department of English bows down before God Almighty, praising and thanking God for his abundant showers of blessing for this endowment lecture. Our resource person, the legendary literary luminary, Dr. Chitra Banerjee Devakarani's lecture was truly one amazing thing. She has indeed pleasantly broken the glass ceiling of the palace of illusions by enchanting us with a mesmerizing talk on the nuances of the beauty of literature. And we can even learn life skills from the timeless treasure books. We are indeed fortunate and honored to have this world famous novelist, poet, philanthropist, and professor of creative writing, University of Houston, USA, Dr. Chitra Banerjee Devakarani to deliver the ninth T.G. Narayanan Endowment Lecture on the felicitous theme, Bridging Barriers Through Literature. Thank you, dear madam, for the illuminating, insightful, and thought-provoking lecture that once again reiterated the fact that literature is indeed a magical living entity and open sesame to the drawing out the varied emotions in our life. Thank you, madam, once again for your presence and your cheerful presentation. We salute the magnanimity of Dr. Ranganarainen, who through this endowment has perpetuated for posterity the legacy of his illustrious father, Mr. T.G. Ranganarainen. The words of Voltaire, and I quote, appreciation is a wonderful thing. It makes what is excellent in others belong to us as well, unquote, holds true for Dr. Ranganarainen, and we appreciate his visionary gesture of instituting the, this endowment lecture and for the prizes instituted for the essay writing contest. Thank you, sir, once again, and your family too. We are much beholden to the entire family for this wonderful gesture. John Milton believes that gratitude bestows reverence. The Madras Christian College is blessed with a visionary leader in Dr. P. Wilson, and together with the Bursa, Mr. Cyrus Kalubarikal deserves a round of applause and reverence for the encouragement and unstinting support to the programs and activities of the Department of English. Cheerfulness and positivity are the hallmarks of our beloved head of the department, Dr. Mekla Rajan, 
who has successfully and pleasantly captained the department. With great pleasure, we thank the sincere and systematic hard work put in by our head of the department, Dr. Mekla Rajan, for the conduct of this endowment lecture. We salute the efforts put in by Professor Arun Kumar and his technical team, consisting of Jerome and Theo. Thank you so much. And we are also ever grateful to the media coverage for this lecture, especially we uh, hats off to Ms. Jayanti of the Hindu publications and if, uh, Mr. Saju of the Times of India. Thank you so much for this media coverage. Let me also take this opportunity to thank all the participants from the length and breadth of the world, the professors from college, in Madras Sustain College, in colleges in and around Chennai, in India, and from various parts of the world. Your presence was indeed very encouraging, and we salute the efforts that you have taken from the time or from your busy schedule to be with us and listen to this great uh, literary giant, legendary Chitra Devakaruni. Once again, a big thank you to one and all who attended today's enlightening endowment lecture. Thank you, dear students, also for your loving presence. And I hope you would have learned a lot from Dr. Chitra's lecture. Once again, a big thank you to the organizers and God bless Madras Sustain College. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ann Thomas, ma'am. It was truly a um, very pleasant uh, vote of thanks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's program. It was an amazing day. It was a beautiful day, most memorable day for all of us. Heartfelt thanks to all of you who have joined from across the world. Special thanks to Professor Narayanan, Professor Devakarani, academicians, students, and everyone who are here. The Department of English, MCC, Department of English, Madras University, who joined with us, and many, many universities and colleges from across the world. We are truly grateful to all of you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I believe we'll carry these memories all our lives. God willing, we will all meet again next year for the 10th TG Narayan Endowment Lecture. Stay safe. God bless you. Bye-bye.